Well, today we're launching into a brand new series called Faith Makers, and, and I'm so excited about it. But to kick off this series, I want to tell you a story about a man called Charles Blondin. You see, Charles Blondin, he, he was an, well, I don't know what you call him, someone who walked along a tightrope, a tightrope walker. That's probably what you'd call him. He was a tightrope walker. And in 1959, he set up a tightrope across the Niagara Falls. And he was the very first person in history to walk across a tightrope from one side of Niagara Falls to the other, from the United States side to the Canadian side. And man, he got a lot of media attention. A whole lot of people turned up because if he fell, he fell. It was a long way down and there was not a lot of hope for him if he fell off this tightrope. But the interesting thing is Charles didn't just walk along this tightrope once. He walked along it time after time after time. He did different things. Sometimes he, um, he carried a chair. Another time he even carried a cooker, sat down, made an omelette while he was on the tightrope, ate the omelette, got up and walked to the other side. He proved in front of the crowds time after time after time that he could get across this tightrope and he was happy to do it. After doing this for a while and, and word spreading and crowds building, more and more people came along. One day Charles walked along the tightrope. He got to the side and he goes, man, who thinks I can push this wheelbarrow from one side to the other? And the whole crowd, thousands and thousands of people cheered. Yeah, you can do it. Yeah. He says, who really thinks I can get from this wheelbarrow, walk across and get it to the other side? He went, yeah, yeah, you can do it. You can do it. But then things changed because Charles said this, who is willing to get into the wheelbarrow? And as soon as he asked people to step into the wheelbarrow, to, to, to not just shout, do you think I can do it? Yes, but do you really think I can do it? Because if you really think I can do it, why don't you come and sit in the wheelbarrow and I'll give you an experience you'll never forget. Do you know what happened to that crowd? All of those people that were cheering, all of those people that were saying, yeah, you can do it, you can do it, suddenly went quiet. The noise level dropped significantly and not one person in the crowd was willing to come and sit in the wheelbarrow. All of these people said, yeah, you can do it, you can do it, you go for it. But as soon as something was on the line, as soon as they had to put themselves into that wheelbarrow, not one person was willing to go and sit in the wheelbarrow. And the reason I start with this is because I think this is an incredible picture of faith. And that's what we're talking about in the series, faith. You see, a lot of people would say, yeah, I believe you can do it. I believe you can get this wheelbarrow across the other side. But when they were asked to come and sit in it, when they were asked to take action on that belief, people weren't willing to do it. And I think this is one of the, the best illustrations you'll ever find for what true faith is. You see, true faith says, hey, not only am I going to say I believe something, but I'm going to take actions that demonstrate my belief. I believe in this so much, I'm not willing just to say, yes, I believe it, but I'm willing to take action because of what I believe. That, my friend, is what faith is. See, you and I, we put faith in things all the time. One of the challenges, I think, that we have in Christianity is that a lot of people think that faith is like this idea that's out there, this, this thing that's far away. But the truth is, as we go through life, you and I put faith in things all the time. We put actions that align with our beliefs. Let me give you a few examples. An example is if you're employed by someone or by an organization, you go to work and you do the work putting faith that your employer is going to pay you on payday. So you, you turn up to work, you do the hours with that expectation and a belief that you're going to get paid, but you actually do that work before getting paid because you don't just simply believe, oh yeah, I'll get paid, but you're certain that you'll get paid, so you put in the work and then the paycheck comes later. You've got faith that your employer is going to 
repay you or reimburse you for the work that you have put in. Another example is, is a chair. Every time we see a chair and we go and sit in that chair, we are putting faith in that chair to hold our weight. See, we look at a chair and we go, man, that looks stable, that looks strong enough, that looks good. If I sit on that, it's going to hold my weight. Come on, maybe you've seen chairs at some places and at some stage and you're looking and you go, oh, I'm not sitting on that because, man, I can see that wood looks rotten. I can see those legs aren't quite aligned very well. And if I sit on that chair, it's not going to take my weight or it's going to topple at some stage. So no, thank you. I'm not going to sit there. But when we see a chair and we sit in it, what we're doing is we're putting faith in that chair to hold us up. One more example, when you're driving down the road. See, when you and I drive down the road, we've got a belief, we've got a hope that everyone else on the road is going to adhere to the, to the road rules, that people are going to stay to the left, that the people coming towards us are going to stay on their side and the people behind us are, are going to stay on our side, that people are going to drive safely into the speed limit, that people aren't just going to cut across in front of us and do a whole lot of crazy things. Well, we've got a, we've got a hope when people see a red light that they're going to stop so when our light goes green, we can go through just sort of unencumbered, that it's going to be smooth. See, as we go through life, you and I, we put faith in a whole lot of things. And what faith really is, is, is us taking actions based on what we believe. When Blondin was walking along this, there was a widespread belief across the crowd that yes, you can do it. Yes, you can get to the other side. They'd seen him go from side to side doing many different things. But when someone said, hey, well, when he said, hey, it's not just enough to believe that I can do it, why don't you come and put something on the line and come with me? No one was willing to do it. And when it comes to our, our faith, when it comes to our faith in God, what I want us to ask ourselves is, do we have a faith that simply says, I believe or I hope? Or do we have a faith that says, no, no, no I'm going to put action in behind what I say. I'm going to put actions in behind what I believe. Because I put it to you today that the, the marker of our faith, the measure of maturity of our faith, is how much we in fact trust God. How much do we trust that God is who He says He is and that He can do what He says He's going to do? You see, it's one thing for us to say we believe it, but until our actions align with those beliefs, I'd suggest that we do not have much faith. The sign of, of you maturing in your faith, the sign of me maturing in my faith, the sign of anyone maturing in their faith in God really is an increasing level of trust that he is who he says he is, and he can do what he says he's going to do. And this makes so much sense, right? Because when you, when you think of any relationship you have with someone, the strength of that relationship is dependent on the trust that is within that relationship. Maybe think of your relationship with a partner, with a spouse. The, the, the strength of that relationship is how much do you trust one another. If you fully trust your partner to do what's maybe in their best interest, but also in your best interest or the best interest of the family or the best interest of what's going on, then man, you, you, you've got a great, strong relationship. If, however, every time you think of them, you're like, oh, I don't know, I don't know if they're going to do the right thing. They're probably going to go and spend all the money again. I don't know if they're going to be home tonight, whatever it might be. When there's not a lot of trust, it's really hard to have relationship. Your closest friends are the ones that you trust the most. Why? Because tr relationships are built on trust. And what God wants from you and what he wants from me is a relationship that's defined by trust. So if we go all the way back to the Old Testament, what do we see in the Old Testament? In the Old Testament, we see the story of Israel learning to trust God. And what we see as you read through the story of the Old Testament is, is the Israelite people trusting God and then stepping away and not trusting God so much. And then things get bad and they lean back into that trust and things start to go better and they pull back away. And it's just this ongoing sort of journey of them trusting and not trusting, trusting and not trusting, trusting and not trusting. So even when, when God led the Israelites out of Egypt, the first thing God did when he was, went to lead them out of Egypt by performing all those 10 miracles was said, saying to the Israelite people, you can trust me. I can do what I said I was going to do. He leads them out into the wilderness. He parts the water. 
He feeds them. He's got a, a, um, a cloud that protects them from the burning sun during the day and a fire that guides them at night. Saying, you can trust me. He drops the food from heaven. says, you can trust me. And only after God has done all of this to prove that he is in fact trustworthy, does he give the Israelites the law to say, hey, hey, if I am going to be your God and you're going to be my people, here are some laws that you should obey. Here's some things you want to put in place so you can live a prosperous and successful life. And he gives them the entire law. But God doesn't give them the law. He doesn't ask the people to trust him with the law until he's first proven that he himself is trustworthy. He is like Blondin, who's walking across the tightrope saying, oh, I can do this, I can do this, I can do this. And then he say, okay, Israelites, listen to me, listen to me. Now you've known that I care about you. Now I've taken you out of bondage. Now I've fed you. Now I've kept you safe. Now I've made sure that you've been taken care of. I want you to trust me and I want you to follow this law that I've given. That might mean you feel less free. That might mean there's certain requirements that are put on you. But you can trust me because look at what I've done for you. My past performance is a great indicator of what you can expect from me. And I've proven myself trustworthy. So now you can trust me. He's really saying, are you willing to get into the wheelbarrow as I push it across this tightrope? And what we just see, as I said, throughout that Old Testament is Israel trusting, not trusting, trusting, not trusting. And every time we see them trust, we see that the, the nation prosper. We see things go well for the people. And as soon as we start to see them not trusting, turning their back on God, it doesn't happen instantly, but over a period of time, it does happen. Things start to go horribly wrong for the nation. Why? Because God wants a relationship with us that's characterized by trust. When Adam and Eve first sinned, what did they do? They broke trust between them and their heavenly Father. And what God's been trying to do ever since is rebuild and reestablish a relationship of trust between Him and us. That's why it's so important in our day and age that we first understand what Jesus has done for us. Because when we first understand what Jesus has done for us, we are essentially should be mind blown that God was willing to come and pay the price that we were meant to pay so that we could have relationship with God, that Jesus gave his life. He so loved us, God did, that he sent his only son so that we won't perish but we'll have eternal life, right? So God said, hey, I've done so much for you. Now he's saying, you can trust me. You can trust me in terms of how you deal with your relationships. You can trust me in terms of how you deal with your time. You can trust me in terms of how you deal with your finances and your positions. You can trust me when it comes to navigating friendships and relationships. You can trust me with your eternity. You can trust me with everything there is because, man, I care about you. I love you so much. I was willing to die for you. And the question that sits at the core, at the center of, man, how mature is my faith? Is simply this, how much do I trust God? Not how much do I say I believe, but how much do my actions show those beliefs? Because I'll tell you what, it is so easy for us as Christians to stand like the crowd on the shores of, of the Niagara Falls, shouting down, we trust you, we trust you, we trust you. I'll sing all the right songs. When God says, man, are you willing to get in the wheelbarrow? Are you willing? When he says, when you actually live your life Monday through Saturday, are you willing to trust me? Are you willing to lean in? What I want to do is, I want to show you two examples in, in the, the accounts of Jesus' life, what are known as the Gospels, they were written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, only two times we see that Jesus was amazed. We see Jesus, wow, we see Jesus actually amazed. Oftentimes we saw the crowd amazed at what Jesus was doing, but only twice in, in all of those writings do we actually find times when Jesus was amazed because of what the people were doing. And both of these have to do with faith. The first one's found in, in Matthew chapter 8. You can also see it um, in, in some of the other Gospels. But I'm going to read it to you from Matthew. This is um, 
a really awesome account about a Roman officer. It says, when Jesus returned to Capernaum, a Roman officer came and pleaded with him, Lord, my young servant lies in bed paralyzed and is in terrible pain. So this Roman officer comes. He knows Jesus has got the ability to, to heal people. He's clearly got a good relationship with this young servant. He wants to see him healed. So this officer comes to Jesus and says, My servant, one of my friends, lies in bed and is paralyzed. He's in terrible pain. And Jesus says, I'll come. Where is he? Take me there. I will come and heal him. But the officer said, Lord, I am not worthy to have you come into my home. To Jesus, I'm not good enough for you to come into my home. Don't take yourself away from what you're doing. Don't get sidetracked by coming to my house. I'm not worthy of that. But this is the part that's phenomenal. The Roman officer says, just say the word from where you are and my servant will be healed. The Roman officer is saying to Jesus, Jesus, you don't need to come to perform this healing. You can just say the word where you are and my servant will get healed. You don't have to be in close proximity to him to heal him. You've got so much power. You are in so, you're in control to such a degree and to such a level that you can heal him no matter where you are. You can do it over Wi-Fi. You can just heal him here even though he's there. Proximity is not important because, man, you are so powerful and you are so in control. And then the Roman officer says why he knows this to be true. He says, I know this because I am under the authority of my superior officers and I have authority over my soldiers. I only need to say go and they go or come and they come. And if I say to my slaves, do this, they do it. Do you know what the officer is saying here? He's saying, Jesus, you're a person of authority. You have authority over sickness. You have authority over, over someone who's paralyzed. You have authority over pain. You have authority over space. You have authority over things. And I, I get that because I'm a man who one is under authority. When my superiors tell me to do something, I do it. If my superiors tell me to go, I go. If my superiors tell me to stay, I stay. And I have people under my authority who if I tell them to go, they go. And if I tell them to stay, they stay. He says, I might not know what it is about you, Jesus, that gives you this authority. I might not know how you've established this authority or where it comes from or how it all works. But what I know, Jesus is that you have authority over sickness. You have authority over disease. You have authority over what's going on in my servant's life. And so you can say the word here, and that's going to take place. Why? Because everything that's happening to my servant is under your authority. So when you say it, it happens. I get authority in Jesus. I've seen enough to know that you have authority over everything that's taking place. I have enough faith. I have enough trust, Jesus. That if you say it, it's going to happen. He says, Jesus, says, you don't need to come with me. I trust you enough. I, I simply don't hope. I simply don't believe, but I trust. I have enough faith that if you say it, it's going to happen. Oh, I don't need you to come so I can hold you accountable if things don't happen. Oh, I don't need you to come so, so if an error occurs, then um, I can say, hey, Jesus, what's going on? Oh, I don't need you to come because I, I need to, to make sure it all happens and then I can release you. I trust you enough. I know you well enough that if you simply say it, it's going to happen and I can go back and my servant is going to be healed. This is phenomenal. When Jesus heard this, when Jesus heard the faith of this Roman centurion, he says, just say the word, keep on going. Jesus was here, it is was amazed. He was amazed. He was wowed. Turning to those who were following him, Jesus said, I tell you the truth. I haven't seen faith like this in all Israel. Let me just skip forward a couple of verses. Then Jesus said to the Roman officer, go back home because you believed it has happened. And the young servant was healed at that same hour. You see, Jesus was amazed by this man's faith. He was amazed by the trust that the Roman centurion put on him. You don't need to come. Just say it and it will be done. Now this second example we're going to look at also is about faith. 
But this time it's a little twist on it. It, it sort of changes a bit. This time Jesus left that part of the country and returned with his disciples to Nazareth to his hometown. The next Sabbath, Jesus began teaching in the synagogue and many who heard Jesus were, there's our word, amazed. Many people who heard Jesus teaching were amazed. People were often amazed by Jesus, but Jesus wasn't often amazed by people. They asked, where did Jesus get all this wisdom and the power to perform such miracles? Then they scoffed. He's just a carpenter. This is his hometown, remember? The boy, we know Jesus. He's the son of Mary and the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon. And his sisters live right here among us. Hey, it's like, hey, he lives around the corner. I used to play footy with his son. I used to see his sister at school. His dad's, you know, the guy that, that, that builds the fences. I know who he is. He's just an ordinary person like us. Hey, who is he? They scoffed. Who is this guy that's doing this? They were deeply offend, offended and refused to believe in Jesus. Then Jesus told them, A prophet is honoured everywhere except in his own hometown and among his relatives and his own family. And because of their unbelief, he couldn't do any miracles among them except to place his hands on a few sick people and heal them. And here we see it again. And he and Jesus was amazed at their unbelief. Here we have Jesus amazed because of their lack of belief. The first time we saw Jesus was amazed because of the Roman centurion's faith. Now Jesus was amazed by the people's lack of faith. In a, in a situation, in a crowd where Jesus, they had heard stories about Jesus, they had known what Jesus was capable of, yet they didn't really believe he was who he says he was. He was amazed. He was like, What? Not in, in a positive sense this time, but in a negative sense because uh, these people's lack of faith. See, the, the only time, well, the only times we see Jesus amazed, when we see Jesus wowed, when we see something just sort of light him up, had to do with faith. Jesus was amazed, excited, wowed because the Roman centurion had so much faith. And he didn't just say what he believed, but he said, Jesus, you don't have to come with me. You go on your way. Just say the word and it'll be done. And then Jesus was amazed, wowed, couldn't believe what he was seeing because of another group of people's lack of faith. So let me ask you a question. What's your faith level like? Do you really trust that God is who he says he is? See, the truth is all of us are on a spiritual journey. All of us need to be continuously taking a next step in our faith journey. All of us have got room to grow in our faith and our trust in Jesus. But I want to ask you a question. Where's your faith? Would Jesus be amazed in the positive sense because of your faith? Would he be amazed in the negative sense because of your faith? He's somewhere in the middle. Where are you? Because what I want to do in this series is simply this. I understand that all of us are on a journey. That all of us go through stages. Sometimes it's like our faith just man, grows really quickly and then it stagnates. And sometimes it can slide. But what, what I know, because the amount of people I've sat with, the amount of people that they don't know about others, and we've talked to them, we've asked to, to share their story and talk about just, just their journey of faith. Some of them, they, they grew up in Christian homes and they, they learned about who Jesus was from a very young age. Other people, like me, it was, it was in their late teens where they started to discover a little bit about faith. Others, it wasn't until later in life when they really started to look into faith. But what we've seen is that as people go on their faith journey, there's six, six things, six catalysts that we just see come up time and time and time and time again in people's journey. And so over the next three weeks, what I want to do each week is just talk about two of these catalysts, two of these things that God uses to grow our faith. And I think this is really, really important. I think this is important if you're new to church and you're at this beginning stage of your faith journey, so you can see what it is that God really uses to grow faith. Some of the things that we'll talk about, we have a lot of control over. 
And when we know these things, we can leverage them. We can say, man, if that's how God grows faith in story after story after story after story, how can I make sure I'm doing that or I'm behaving like that or I'm putting myself in places where that's going to happen so that God can grow my faith? Some of the things we have very little control over or no control over. But it's so nice to be aware of them because these are things that are going to happen in your life and in my life. And when we're aware that these are things that God can use to grow faith or that we can use to turn our back on faith, it becomes so much more powerful. So if you're new to faith, this is so good for you to understand how the things that God is most likely going to use to grow your faith in the coming weeks, months, years, and even decades. For others of us that have been around faith for a long time, well, what I'm certain of is as we go through these six things, You're going to go, man, yeah, that's true of me. I remember back then. I remember this. I remember that. I remember when. I remember him. I remember her. I remember that. And what will happen is you'll go, man, those are so true. Because we see these coming up time and time and time again in people's faith journeys. And so I'm so excited to unpack these two a week over the next six weeks. And I think when you and I can know what these are and we can leverage them, it positions us to be in a place where we simply don't say we believe something, but our actions back up that belief. Because do you know what I want for you? I want this not simply for you. I want this for my kids. I want this for for everyone I come across. Is is that they have such a deep trust in God that that when that wheelbarrow moments come in their life, they'll say, yeah, okay, God. I'll get in the wheelbarrow. You'll walk along the tie rope. I'll sit here. You hold the wheelbarrow and you guide me along. And they've got enough trust, not just to sit there on the sidelines chanting, saying, yeah, 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 or coming into to, to an environment where they can sing all the right songs and maybe even pray the, pray the right prayers, but whose actions are backing up the words that they're singing, the prayers that they're praying, the beliefs that they're stating. You see, I think that's what it's all about. In Hebrews 11, this is sort of the start of, of the hall of fame of people of faith, right? And, and what it does is it gives us a definition of what faith is. The author of Hebrews writes this, Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. See, faith is confidence. Faith is taking action. Faith is giving substance to. Faith is doing something based on what we hope for, or based on what we believe. I believe this to be true, so faith's going to cause me to actually do something. I'm going to take action based on what I believe. I've got this hope because of what Jesus has done, but but that hope's going to play itself out because I'm not just going to go, yeah, I I think it could happen. Yeah, I think you can walk along that tightrope. No, no, I'm going to get in the wheelbarrow because I'm confident in what I hope for. So I'm going to put my actions into play. See, there's a series, Faith Makers. And it's all about six things God uses to grow your faith, six things he uses to grow my faith, six things that we see come out time and time and time and time again in the stories of people that have got faith. But this is, this is so important. And I, I really, really, really want you to, to get this. That what God wants from you, what he wants from me, what amazes him, what amazed Jesus is still what amazes God. And that's our faith. That's our faith. See, we read the story of the Israelites in the Old Testament and we see up and down, up and down, up and down. And we look at them and think, man, are you idiots? Are you stupid? Are you silly? Look at what happens when you just trust God. And look at what happens when you don't. But that's so often the story of your life and my life, right? Enough's happened in our life that we should be able to trust God. We've seen Him do this and we've seen Him do that. Yet we still find ourselves going through these ups and these downs and these ups and these downs, these times where it's easy to lean in and times where it's like, oh, I can do this on my own. But what God really wants from you, what He really wants from me, is this deep level of faith. Not us simply stating what we believe, but taking actions based on what we believe. See, what, what God really wants is us to trust him, to trust that he is who he says he is and that he can do what he says he's going to do. And I'll tell you what, when we put that level of faith in him, when we really trust him that much, I think we still amaze him. You see, God knows. God created it like this. 
He created all relationships to be defined by trust. And what he wants from you, what he wants from me, he doesn't want simple obedience for the sake of obedience because we have to. He wants us to obey him because we trust him. Because we say, okay, God, I know you've got my best interests at heart. God, I know that you can work all things together for the good of those who love you and according to your purpose. So I believe that you're going to do something good in this. God, God I, I know I can trust you with my time. God, I, I, I know it's hard because everyone around me is working so hard and trying to get ahead here and trying to get ahead there and, 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 and doing so much. And, and you, you call me to, to take a Sabbath once a week, 24 hours, where I can just slow down where I can step back, where I don't work, where I just rest, where I just be. And God, okay, I trust you enough that I'm going to lay aside that 24-hour period every single week to just be, to rest. And I'm going to trust as I look around at other people working harder than me, other people studying in those hours when I'm resting, that I'm going to be able to get the results that they're getting, that I'm going to be able to achieve the marks that they're getting doing it in those times. And that you're going to bless the rest that I take. Good God, I know you've given me these talents and, and I could use those talents to go and, and make more money. But, but you want me to serve some people that are around me. So I'm going to get involved in church. I'm going to give up time on a Wednesday night and go along to youth. I'm going to give up time on a, on a Thursday night and rehearse with the band. And I'm going to turn up early on a Sunday and I'm going to play with the band. Or, or I'm going to be on a production guys and turn up super early and give my time. And use my talents to, to bless those that are around me. And God, I know I'm not going to get paid for it, but man, I think you're going to do something even greater through it. So I'm going to lay down my talents. God, 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 I'm going to trust you. I'm going to trust you with my money. God, I'm going to trust you in terms of how I treat people. I'm going to trust what you say about forgiveness. I'm going to trust that, that, I, I, that when I pray that you're listening. And that's what he wants from us, a relationship that's defined by trust. So let me ask you a question. And again, there's, there's no right answer here. There's just, we've got to confront some facts in our life and we've just got to be honest about where we sit. Where are you? Do you trust God? Maybe you're in a place where you're like, saying, Man, I, don't, I don't believe in God at all. I'm trying to figure this Christian thing out. Man, that's awesome. You shouldn't trust him yet. If you don't know what he's done for you and you don't want to put too much trust in him, can I encourage you if that's you? To go and talk to someone. Say, man, can you explain to me? Can you help me understand what it is that God has done for me? Because when you can start to understand it, you realize he is worthy of your trust. Some some of you watching this, man, you trust God deeply. So that when situations and circumstances suggest that you shouldn't trust God, you still trust him. That when things are going horrible in your life and you don't understand why, you still trust that God's present. Can I just say you're amazing, you inspire me. You're the real deal. Some of us. And we are kind of like those people on the banks, right? Yeah, God can do it. Yes, God. Yes, God's got me. Yes, God's got me. But we're not, getting, we're not willing to get into that wheelbarrow. Can I ask you to do me a favor? Just identify one area right now that God's calling you to trust them with and just go, okay, God, I'm going to trust you with this and see what he does. Because that's kind of the way I feel for a lot of us, our faith journey is. We trust him with one area and God becomes, God comes through faithful and we trust him with another area. God comes through faithful. So we trust him with another area and God comes through faithful and we trust him with another area and another area and another area. And over time, God continues to prove himself faithful. Well, what's the area of your life you're right now saying, man, I just, I'm not trusting God with this. I'm not trusting God with this. Can I encourage you to trust God with it? See, the, the reason faith is so important, the reason faith, I think, speaks so much and amazes God is because it amazes us, right? See, most of us that have got a faith or are trying to figure out faith is because we know people that have got faith and we've seen how they've behaved in circumstances when they shouldn't have faith, when they got that medical diagnosis that said, hey, you, you shouldn't have trust God. When they've, they've gone through just relational turmoil and, and things have gone so hard and you, through it all that they've maintained integrity, maintained faith. And we're like, wow. When we see people who, are, who have faced so much hurt and so much brokenness and that they've still got their faith, there's something about that that, how, that just makes us admire them. That makes us go, man, I wish I had 
his faith. I wish I had his strength. I, I wish I had her courage. I wish I could carry myself the way that she carries herself because of how they walk through adversity and difficult circumstances. And if we're people of faith, that's what we'll be able to do. But it takes us having that true level of trust. Not just a belief that says something, but a conviction that says, no, God is who he says he is. He can do what he says he's going to do. What I'd love to do is just play a song for you. As, as, as you watch, as you listen, can I encourage you maybe to close your eyes, to take a, a deep reflection and say, God, do I really trust you? Do, do, I, do I say the right words, but then live like all my trust is in myself? Or, or do I really trust you? Am I willing to do things your way, or do I always want to do them my way? And then I, I encourage you to, to pray this prayer. God, give me eyes to see the areas of my life that I'm not trusting you. And I think if we pray, uh, pray that prayer, create some room. God might just show us how you and how I, how we can all trust them more. So enjoy the song and I'll come back because I'd love to pray for you. Enjoy.
that. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much. Now, I thank you so much that before you asked anything from us, you did everything for us. Before you ask us to trust you, you first prove that you are in fact trustworthy. And Father, I pray then firstly that all of us will know that you are trustworthy. I pray you'll help us to look into the claims that, that Jesus really is the Son of God and we'll start to see, wow, and be just amazed by what you've done for us. And in turn, that will lead us to want to trust you so deeply. Father, I really do pray you'll reveal to all of us those areas in life where we are not fully trusting you. And I pray that you'll increase our faith. You'll help us trust you more. And Father, I pray as I think ahead for the next few weeks of the series, that you'll help us just talk with openness and honesty about these, these six catalysts, these six things you use to grow faith. I pray that you'll help us be able to look back and see them in our journey. But more importantly, I pray that you'll help us to leverage them as we move forward in our faith. I pray this in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen, 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 amen. Hey, thank you so, so much for joining us today. You have a great week. Stay connected with us on social media. Reach out, say hi. We'd love to connect. And um, we'll see you back here next Sunday.